We are the Geographic Data Visualisation Team at Ordnance Survey. Um, I'll go into what that is and what we do a little bit more in a second. Um, but yeah, it's going to be us three who are doing the presentation this evening to you all. So a quick agenda, we're going to start off with an entry. Um, and then we're going to have a short overview of Ordnance Survey's history. Some of this you may know, some of this might be new to you. Um, and then we're going to look at what is cartography before going into how maps actually made Ordnance Survey and ultimately how we decide what we show and what we also don't show on the maps. And then there'll be, as I said, about 15 minutes for questions at the end. So we are the Geographic Data Visualisation Team, often gets shortened to Geodata Viz or GDV. Um, there's only three of us who work at Ordnance Survey doing this, um, so it's quite a small team. And Paul is the team lead, and then Hannah and I both work alongside him on projects as well. And the kind of purpose of our team is to help the public sector and OS customers to make sense of data through maps and visualisations. We're really lucky we get to do some cool creative projects and make one-off maps a lot of the time and stuff that's a little bit different to the maps you might be used to when you think of Ordnance Survey. Um, and we also get to deliver a lot of talks and presentations just like this one, which we really love doing. So a quick intro to the history of Ordnance Survey. Um, OS was initially created in 1796. We're a pretty old organisation. Um, and that was when the UK was at risk of invasion by France. Um, the southeast coast, obviously being closest to France, was the one under threat. And Parliament at the time needed a really accurate depiction of the land and of that coastline to be able to plan their defence strategies and ward off risk of attack, basically. And because of this, Ordnance Survey began with a very military focus. And the things that are shown on this map, on the first Ordnance Survey map, um, are very related to that. So they're things which would be relevant to kind of military strategy, planning, defence, all those sorts of things. Um, we often say that essentially the things that are shown on this map are ones that you could hide behind as a soldier or things that would act as an obstruction as a kind of to ward off the attack. And that's where the name Ordnance Survey comes from. So ordnance meaning things like cannons and other military defence weapons, and then survey because we were plotting where all of those military bases were located. So when you put those together, you obviously get Ordnance Survey. Um, and as I mentioned, this map on the screen is the very first Ordnance Survey map. Although OS came to be in 1796, this map wasn't published until 1801. As you can imagine, it took quite a long time to get all of the information and plot it really accurately on a map. And over our history, we've changed a little bit, as you can imagine. So we've gone from mapping organisation with a real military focus. Um, our offices actually used to be in the Tower of London um, uh, right at the start of when OS came to be. Then we moved to a bit more of a leisure focused organisation with the map covers reflecting that as well, showing people exploring their natural world and kind of as peacetime in uh, Great Britain happened after World War II, people had more time and were more able to explore their landscapes around them. And now obviously we're in the digital age and our mapping has followed that with things like the OS Maps app, which I'm sure lots of you are very familiar with. So you probably recognise the maps on this slide, the Ordnance Survey, Land Ranger and Explorer maps, the 25 and 50,000. Um, these are examples of leisure maps um, and they're probably the thing that springs to mind when you think of OS. But actually, they're a very small part of what we do as a whole organisation. Um, mostly people at Ordnance Survey work on geospatial data um, and that is data that is related to something which has got a location attached to it. And they use that to solve problems. Lots of the work we do is with other public sector organisations like local councils, emergency services and government bodies. And they'll often take audience survey data on things like buildings, terrain, infrastructure sites and use it to better understand and plan the areas that they look after. Um, OS maps and the data that goes into them aren't just for walkers, uh, but maps 
are really needed for all sorts of different things like Royal Mail so that they know where to deliver your letters, bin men and women knowing where to collect your bins from, um, parents knowing where the closest schools are to their homes, ambulances knowing where to go in an emergency and I've got a screenshot here but I'm just going to show the full video um, which gives I think a really nice sense of all of the different uses that Ordnance Survey data is used for every day that you might not have considered. So hopefully that gives you a bit of an idea of the real breadth of different use cases that data um, from Ordnance Survey is used in every day and you probably use it a lot of times without even noticing as well. Um, and just to go into a little bit more detail about what we do as a team and how we use data to create kind of interesting visualizations and maps. So OS data is used to support big decision making, but often that data still needs to be visualised to make it a lot more understandable for people. And that's really what we do in our team. We take that geographic data and visualise it to tell stories. And that is really important in helping people to understand the data set more easily. So we've got some examples on the screen here of where we've done this. On the left hand side, we've got an image showing Scarfell Pike and footpath usage. Um, this is using data from the OS Maps app to see where the highest density of people are walking, which can be really helpful for things like mountain rescue, for planning kind of footpath maintenance and just general distribution of people on the mountain as well. Then in the middle, we've got an image showing paper map August, and we can see here from yellow to kind of dark purple being where the most maps are being ordered. Um, you can see where the real hotspots are and where the kind of density of, of people placing orders for those custom maps are going and also where they're not going as well, which is a really interesting thing to know. And then on the right hand side is an example of maps that we create to highlight specific areas or a specific event in some cases as well. Um, this is a running challenge that's quite well known up in Scotland and we wanted to show the route in a lot of detail, show the elevation profile and kind of celebrate what an immense achievement it is to, to do this event as well. So I'm just going to go quickly into what cartography actually is. And you are probably familiar with the term. If you signed up to this talk, you're probably interested in it anyway. But it's not so simple as a very specific definition. So there are lots of different definitions, some of them being um, a sheet of paper or a map um, and the study and practice of making maps or a combination of science, aesthetics and technique uh, and it building on the premise that reality can be modelled in ways that communicates spatial information effectively. But the definition that we like to use is from the British Cartographic Society and that just And when we think about what a map is, we uh, probably have lots of different images in our minds. So it could be something like this. 
or it could be something a bit more like this, which you would obviously view on a computer or a phone and you can scroll around, zoom in and out and click on things. Or it could even be something like this, which is a bit more aesthetic. It's got kind of terrain as a 3D element um, and shows you that third dimension as well. But actually, a map is essentially just a graphic summary of the wider world. It's that geography of the world around us presented as points, lines, polygons um, and symbols as well that are all scaled down and simplified to make them understandable. It's really about that relative position and nature of features that are summarised to be able to communicate a message or tell a story about a place. Um, and as you've just seen, maps can vary a lot in their forms. Um, mostly, though, maps are trying to convey a factual message and portray aspects of that real world geography. But basically, drawing a map um, is a way to help us understand our world a bit better. And in the past, um, we've used the tools of cartography a lot to represent our immediate surroundings and the wider world as well, um, and to be able to convey that to other people in, in quite a factual sense of where things are. But nowadays, interestingly, maps are increasingly being used to showcase specific regions or to kind of characterise local scenes and even to invoke certain moods and to tell stories as well. And they can be really powerful in that sense as well. So now I'm just going to hand over to Paul to talk through how maps are made. Thanks, Jess. Evening, everyone. Yeah, I'm just going to talk through the kind of process and the stages that go into making maps from scratch, because as I'm sure you can imagine, there's a lot of things that go into that whole map making process. So we're going to look at that in a bit more detail now. Um, Jess, are you OK? Even us on to the next slide. Cool. Right, so before you can even think about making a map, you obviously need data or information about the area that you want to map, right? So this is all about how you go ahead and collect all of that information. Um, and so go, kind of go, going back in history, kind of the earliest methods of gathering data about our Earth geography were restricted to kind of sailors or travellers reports. You know, they've gone somewhere and they report on what they'd seen. And then that eventually gave way to surveyors who were producing maps from their own observations or their own travels. Um, but it wasn't really until the kind of development of mathematics and then scientific instruments like the compass, uh, the telescope or the field of light, which kind of then led to the systematic and kind of scientific measurement of our landscape, which really was a kind of major step forward. At Ordnance Survey, um, we collect data about Great Britain um, in a number of different ways. And these processes that we've used that kind of have evolved over the years too. Um, I think it's probably fair to say you can't be a kind of surveyor on the ground. Um, at Ordnance Survey, there are 230 surveyors, each of which cover their own kind of piece uh, of Great Britain. So when there are changes in their area that need mapping, they will go and capture that information it's needed to then make make those changes. So this could be a new housing estate, it could be a new road, or it could be a new footpath, for instance. Um, field survey has been around for many years. It's kind of just a technology. And if you look at the picture on screen and the outfits that have changed, you know, look very different from what they did many years ago. Um, and today our surveyors use a highly accurate GPS, so a geographic positioning system device, um, which maps where things are down to like just a few centimetres and that surveyor will use that GPS to kind of trace around the perimeters of a feature so a feature like a building or on the side of a road to mark where the edge of that feature is then that information that the surveyor has captured and collected can then be sent back to Ordnance Survey for storing in a massive database or, or like a master map of Great Britain. Um, it's probably fair to say that, you know, surveying to a lot of people might seem like a, a really great job, but it's worth remembering that although they get to spend a lot of their days outside, it can be uh, when it's absolutely pouring down with rain, just as it can be uh, if it's a beautiful sunny day like it is today in Southampton. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, 
Next up is image capture. We do have a little bit of an issue with this slide. We have a gremlin with it that we don't seem to have sorted. So there might be an image missing at the moment that might appear in a minute and then another one might disappear. So just bear with us on that. Um, so image capture. So at Ordnance Survey, we have two planes with OS Livery based at Retford in Nottingham. And when it's not cloudy, these can fly up and down Great Britain, taking pictures of the landscape. And they can fly between about five and out at eight hours per day. Each plane has a pilot and a camera operator who looks after a really high definition camera that sticks out the bottom of the plane. And then that digital camera, the data from that digital camera is downloaded from the aircraft straight after flying and then is sent to us at HQ in Southampton for processing. Um, and I think we capture something like 150,000 aerial images of areas in Great Britain every year. So that amounts to about 80,000 square kilometres of imagery covering about one third of Great Britain, which is then used for updating our detailed mapping imagery and our digital terrain model project products. Um, so from the image on the left that you can see on the screen at the moment that's, that's come on and sadly the other one's disappeared, you can see that there's, there's not a lot of room on these planes, but the images they capture are amazing. And there's a guy who uh, is a camera operator on one of our on one of our planes who often sends pictures via his Twitter or his X account, I should say, which are always worth seeing because he does capture some absolutely amazing pictures. Um, and then more recently, we've started to use drones to help capture imagery. And, and these are great because they can get to survey areas that perhaps surveyors um, may sometimes not be able to get access to from the ground. They are also great in an emergency um, when up to date imagery, imagery might be required at very short notice. Um, so companies that survey using drones have the ability to send them up really quickly and capture uh, aerial images, yeah, aerial imagery images really fast. And then we've also started to use third party data to add value to some of our data. So this can include a number of things that our surveyors don't capture, like building age and number of floors within the building too. Uh, and all this data capture kind of underpins uh, what is the most detailed and frequently updated mapping in the whole of the world. So it is really quite an impressive feat. Next slide, please, Jess. OK, digitising. So the high definition images that our planes capture um, when, they're, when they're back at HQ, they're overlaid with existing map data, so map data that we already have on screen to then check where features have changed. And then instant updates can then be quickly identified and then we can make those changes to our data. We have a team called Remote Sensing um, and they use digital programmatic workstations or DPWs and they use specialised equipment to kind of display stereo images overlaid with our mapping data. And you can see on screen they, they wear these kind of funny glasses so that it allows them to see their screens in stereo and then kind of freely what makes it easier for them to piece everything together. Um, we obviously collect geospatial data in a range of lines and a range of points and polygons and it gives a really comprehensive representation of the land of Great Britain. And this is called vector data, to which we can then attach further information. So on our roads, for example, we can add routing information, which, which shows what type of road it is, whether it has any traffic calming measures in place or any restrictions along its course. So we can really enrich that data with more information as part of its attribution. And then all that data is stored at Ordnance Survey, and there are, are over 500 million features within that one database. But there's absolutely tons of information. Next slide, please, Jess. So now we've captured all this data, then, it, then it's really a cartographer's time to shine. And they can use this information within that massive database to create a variety of different maps for different users and different uses. And it's a cartographer's job to make sense of this data, to make sense of the geography of an area. And they use a number of different techniques to do this. And it's fair to say it's a really complicated process. It's not just about, about colouring in. A lot more goes into making ge geographic data understand, understandable. And Hannah will touch on that a little bit later. Um, some of the very first maps were drawn by hand um, using ink brushes and parchment and were limited in number and were unique and of very high value and they would take a very long time to make. It wasn't until the invention of the printing press that allowed kind of that mass production and distribution of, of just one map 
Um, and since the 1970s, computer technology has joined up that whole process of kind of data capture, map creation, reproduction, distribution, and then map use in a way that was totally unimaginable in the past. We then had the invention of geographic information systems or GIS, and that really changed the game and have kind of have, have continued to evolve and improve the way we work with and visualize geographic data. And right now, um, there is a massive range, huge range of software, different tools and equipment to help us with that full, make, full map making process. Um, they really are, we're kind of really blessed at the moment with a huge range of software and tools to allow us to create maps, capture data for that kind of whole process for, for creating maps. Next slide, please, Jess. And then once a map is finished, um, it's important it's checked over for any quality issues. Um, so here the QC process is looking for issues with the data, um, any spelling errors or issues with the printing where there might be miscellaneous lines on the map that aren't supposed to be there. And that's a really important part of the process. It's something that we do a lot of in our team, you know, checking each other's works to make sure there's no issues with the quality of what's going out. Next slide, please, Jess. So I've just brought this slide back in, which Jess used it earlier, because I think it's, it's quite a nice slide, just to kind of finish on how maps are made. So, you know, at Ordnance Survey, we do produce a real um, large range of cartographic products um, that are all at a range of different scales and they're all made for different users. Some are designed for walkers and cyclists to enjoy the outdoors, whilst others are produced as backdrop mapping for other people to lay da their own data on top. And that's the map making process. I'm going to hand over to Hannah now. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Um, so we're now going to kind of have a bit of a look about the maps themselves. Um, at OS, you're um, you're probably very familiar with sorry these OS maps um, that are on screen today. So this is the much loved Explorer and Land Ranger maps. We don't actually make those within our team. They're made within our cartograph um, cartography department. But both Paul and I have worked there in the past. Um, I'm sure many of you are kind of avid users of these maps. Um, but have you ever actually thought of how we kind of decide what to put on the maps and what techniques cartographers employ um, to ensure that the maps are legible and usable. As you've already heard, um, Ordnance Survey has its roots in the military, um, as Jess said. Um, Post-war, the nation really wanted to kind of get out and explore more. So be that in the motor car, um, on a bike or perhaps as a rambler. So this uptaking kind of leisure pursuits meant that roads and footpaths started to become more important um, and thus uh, became emphasised on our maps. And this is really kind of where the OS leisure maps were born. Hopefully if Jess clicks on, there should be some beautiful covers um, that were designed in the 1920s by the artist Ellis Martin. So they depicted people kind of exploring and getting out in the local countryside. And this was a really kind of marked shift um, in kind of the style of OS maps um, and these were designed to kind of help map sales and it really, really worked um, and kind of map scales skyrocketed um, after that point. Next slide, be Jess. But how do we decide what to put on our maps? Our National Geographic database contains over 500 million real world features, so half a billion real world features. So this is from roads to buildings, bridges to field boundaries, green space to waterways and everything in between. These features, as you know, Paul said, are captured in immense detail, but we also have very rich attribution about them. So, for example, if we think about buildings, we know where they are and we know their shape. We also would probably know how tall they are, um, how many addresses and which addresses are in each building, whether they're commercial or residential addresses, whether perhaps the building has a basement, what they're made from and an indication of how old they are. But we can't show all of these 500 million real world features and all this attribution on a map, um, particularly a printed map. They would all overlap and they would make the map completely intelligible. So if we think about the one to 25,000 Explorer map, you've got four centimetres to represent one kilometre in the real world. So if you think about what happens within one kilometre from your own house, all of that kind of detail, every pavement, every road, every patch of grass, every street lamp, every bin, every tree, every waterway, every bench. Could you actually fit that onto four centimetres and still have a legible map? Probably not. 
And then this is made worse for things like our one to 50,000 Land Ranger map, where you've actually only got two centimetres to summarise what happens in that one kilometre on the ground. So as cartographers, we have to make decisions about what to include and more importantly, what to omit from our maps in order to make them legible, understandable and usable. So how do we go about making these decisions? Next slide, please, Jess. So firstly, we think about the user and this goes for every map and data visualisation that we make and is integral to everything we do. If a map doesn't meet, meet the needs of the user, it won't be used. So if we take the 1 to 25,000 Explorer map, which you can see in the centre of that screen, um, it's designed to be a general purpose topographic map with a focus on leisure activities. So you may use them to plan cycle routes and walking routes um, and then use the same maps to navigate along them. So that's the sort of planning and the navigation that they're catering for. And it could be that you're planning something in a city or perhaps it's in kind of remote mountainous terrain. So we need things like contours, rock outcrops, scree slope and land cover. But these maps are also used um, by the military um, for, you know, as Jess said, you know, their sort of operations. They're also used by things like local authorities for planning and decision making, by environmental organisations um, to manage land or coordinate conservation e efforts. Each of these users wants different things on that map. So we have to think very carefully about all of the, the different users um, when creating these maps. Sadly, no map can show everything. So it's often a really tricky balance um, due to space constraints to kind of balance those needs of the very varied users that use a single map. If we're thinking about recreational users, they'll want things on there like roads, footpaths, cycle routes, public toilets, perhaps bike hire, botanical gardens, viewpoints, campsites, you know, parking and other tourist facilities. Um, but this is very different to perhaps the military. They're not very interested in those sort of tourist symbols. So it really is a balance. So there's all those features that we want to put on the map, but we also require lots of labels because labels often make the map understandable. They help you use that map and they help you orientate yourself on that map. You probably also need things like grid squares, a legend, an indication of north, uh, so that again, these kind of maps can be understood and used for navigation. So it's quite a lot to think about and a lot of features to try and include, um, each of which takes up space, um, particularly text, um, surprisingly. But if Jess clicks on, we can have a look at an example of a map which was designed uh, for just a specific purpose. So this map was designed to kind of help people uh, get out and about more specifically families um, from kind of more disadvantaged backgrounds living in Birmingham. So to get them out on their bikes and explore the green spaces around the city. It was designed to be a bit more playful and family friendly using quite sort of cartoon, cartoony icons. But it also contains, contains key navigational features, things like road names and landmarks. As it's designed for cyclists, the route is made very clear and it differentiates between on road and traffic free sections. Warnings have been included where the road crosses um, busy roads um, and where junctions contain kind of cycle and pedestrian crossings. But as it could also be used to plan a day out with children, it includes things like play parks, coffee shops and other attractions. We've also included kind of zoomed in sections to help users navigate busy junctions um, and even details the type of bike you might need. We haven't included any unnecessary minor roads to reduce that clutter um, and we haven't obviously included every cafe in Birmingham. So thinking about the user really helps us decide what we put on our maps and how we style them. Next slide please Jess. So the level of detail we show is very dependent on the scale of the map. So, for example, our master map topography layer, which is on the left in this image uh, on this slide, is designed to be viewed about one to 2,500. So one centimetre on the map is just 25 metres on the ground. And as a result, we can show a lot more detail. So we can show things like lines of bollards, pavements, electricity, substations and individual building numbers. However, on the right, we have our mini scale product um, and these are designed to provide provide a general overview of Great Britain. The use cases for these two maps are very different and therefore the features we show are very different. 
So two of the core principles of cartography and data visualization are simplicity and legibility. So as I said before, one of the biggest decisions a cartographer has to make when designing a map is actually what to omit from the map. What information is not necessary to meet the needs of that user? Next slide, please, Jess. So once we've decided um, ideally what we want to show on our map and we know a bit more about the scale and therefore what level of detail is possible, um, we need to then go about thinking what these features look like. So as we move from the large scale map, so that's things like OS master map topography layer to the smaller scales. So that could be you know, mini scale, but in between that, we've got like one to 50,000 maps. We have less space to represent the same area. And as a result, we have to make a decision um, as to how to change the way we display features to ensure they remain legible. So, for example, we know some features such as rivers are very complex. They've got lots of twists and turns, but we can't show all of this complexity at all scales. So in order to reduce that complexity um, of features and maintain that legibility, we use a number of techniques which we call generalization techniques. So the first process, um, which you can see in that kind of little graphic um, on the right, actually you can't see it on this one, is elimination. And um, so that is basically what we uh, remove from the map. So what is ne necessary at that new scale? Um, so this could be removing minor roads um, as you move from the whole of GB view um, to um, you know, a more detailed scale. Um, the other way around more detailed to more zoomed out, you might remove those minor roads. But this might not work for every use case um, as a minor road in a rural area, but might be more important than it is in an urban area. So in these places, we may selectively eliminate features. And this is a decision made by our cartographers to quite a strict specification. So the next technique um, we use is amalgamation. Um, you'll notice on are the one to 50,000 land ranger map on screen. Um, we will merge adjacent buildings um, into building blocks to kind of help maintain that legibility. If Jess clicks on, we'll see the 25,000 map of the same area. Um, so we can show more granular buildings and outlines. There's still some amalgamation at this level, um, but less so because um, of the map scale. Another thing we can do is simplify things. Um, so we want to maintain the overall shape and character of that feature. Jess clicks on, hopefully there is a river on screen. Um, so this is Wallet Brook. Um, if you kind of have, keep your eye on the sort of top left of the um, woodland in the center of that, if we move to the one to 50,000 map, Hopefully you can see that that kind of complexity has been sort of ironed out, it's been smoothed out. So that's how we might sort of simplify things to make sure that it's still legible. We remove that complexity. I haven't got an example of this um, apart from exaggeration on the right hand side. Sometimes we may have to exaggerate certain things, but don't worry at the scale that you use these at Explorer and Land Range maps, it doesn't make a difference. Um, but it's just to make sure that you can understand that there is separation between two items. So if we look at that bay, if we just shrunk it down, it starts to become hard to see that there is actually a gap and that you cannot walk um, from one side to the other. So we might you know, exaggerate these things very, very slightly um, so that you can kind of understand that relationship between features. Exaggeration also applies to things like the width of streams and roads. So if you take a two meter wide stream, um, if we tried to show that on an Explorer map at scale, it would be 0.08 millimeters wide. Um, so you wouldn't actually be able to see it, um, let alone print something this small. So that two meter wide stream to a walker in a very mountainous area might actually be quite significant in terms of crossing that or as a navigational aid. So we want to map that feature so we have to exaggerate it slightly um, so that it's visually perceivable on the map. But as I said, at the scales that you use them and for what you use them for, this doesn't actually um, matter, but it's just a technique we use to make sure that those maps are understandable and legible. And this is quite similar um, to another technique we use um, to ensure those relationship between features is maintained and visible. Um, so um, 
in the sort of bottom right, we've got displacement. And again, as you shrink the scale, features start to overlap because of that exaggeration um, that we have to do so you can see it. So we may move these um, features very, very slightly apart. So this relationship is clear. And again, at the scale of the maps you use, it doesn't matter. It's just so that the human eye can visually discern and understand the relationship between those features. If you think about what happens perhaps in a valley bottom, you might have a road, a river, a footpath and a railway all right next to each other in quite a constrained geography. So we need to un make sure that you guys understand that you know, there is a separation between those, but they, they run adjacent to each other. So the final technique um, I was going to cover today um, is called um, collapse. Um, so this is where we simplify the ge geometry of a feature. Um, so for example, here we've got the outline of Perth. Um, you can see it as a city, it's kind of got an outline. As we um, zoom out, essentially, um, it becomes a point on a map of the whole of GB. So the same would happen for things like an airport. At the large scales, we would show every runway and every building, um, but the smaller scales, we would probably just show it as a point symbol. If you click on, please, Jess. So that might give you an idea of we, what we kind of might include on our maps and how we decide kind of which features to show at which sh scales. But what priority um, you know, features get priority and why do we show what we do? So it loops back to thinking about that user. So given that our paper maps are often um, used for kind of route planning and navigation, we prioritize features that support this and we make these features more obvious. As such, on our maps, features such as roads and rights of way are quite prominent as our tourist symbols. All maps um, will be designed with certain features that stand out more um, based on what we can kind of consider is more important to that user. And this is known as the visual hierarchy. Other features, um, perhaps, you know, such as the contours might sync to the background and provide more context. Um, if you look at um, example, it's, there's a one to 250,000 map on the right hand side. Although we do have contours and kind of hypsometric tints, so the colouring of, of that topography on there, they there for sort of more context, um, but the kind of road detail and the tourist symbols um, and kind of labels to help you kind of navigate at that macro scale stand out more. So other features that we include will think be things that um, act as key navigational aids. So there'd be things like places of worship, wind turbines and solar farms. These are often very obvious in the landscape and will really help users orientate themselves in relation to the map. So on the more detailed scale, um, you know, on the left in example, this is the one to 25,000 mapping. Um, if you're navigating in complex terrain in the mountains, key features might be a little bit more few and far between. You might not have huge, great big wind turbines or places of worship as a reference. It might be something as simple as a stream crossing, a fence line or a track. Although not every feature can be shown, features which would help with that navigation are prioritised. Um, contours can also be really important navigational air, um, aids um, as you're kind of, are you walking uphill or downhill, which aspect of the slope, um, how steep it, is it and are there kind of little kind of re-entrance or kind of kinks in that contour that might give you a bit of detail as to, to where you are. So if we look at that image on the left, if you're walking along that black path from left to right, you'll expect to cross a ford. Um, and there's a possible area of kind of water or kind of boggy ground um, probably to your right. You'll then start moving gradually uphill and through a band of rocks before reaching some old disused shelters, which may be just subtle piles of stone. You'll then come to a steep drop um, and the path continues um, with the drop to your left. So all of these features on the map will help with navigation and are thus included on our mapping. As we've said before, the level of detail will depend on that scale on the map um, of the map. So the one to 25,000 maps are explorer maps. We can show most detail. Um, we can show fence, li fence lines, for example. But on a one to 50,000 map, um, we have to make a compromise on what is shown. Um, we do regularly review what is shown on our maps based on kind of user engagement. So, for example, solar farms were introduced a, f a few years ago um, as they started to appear as those kind of key features in our landscape.
Next slide, please, Jess. So other than making um, features more visible than others, we also use kind of color and symbols to help you understand the map. So we use conventional colors, um, blue for water, green for green space, to help you kind of understand what you're looking at. We also add symbols such as kind of trees to help you understand that um, type of woodland in that area. Perhaps if it, is it coniferous, is it deciduous, or maybe it's mixed. Or if there's an area of kind of marshy ground, we'll add symbols to kind of help you understand that. We also use colour to help you understand things like the road hierarchy. Um, on the um, right, we've got a section of our land ranger mapping. Um, a roads are red, B roads are orange, minor roads are yellow and local roads are white. These colours have been chosen on purpose to help you understand the map. We naturally perceive colours as having a hierarchy. There are a sequence um, and this is kind of built into human perception. So red is seen as more important than orange and orange more important than yellow and yellow more important than white. So this sort of clever use of colour can just help you understand and read our maps. Um, next slide, please, Jess. And finally, as we mentioned earlier, we're we constantly evolve what needs to be included in our maps, but that also means that maps can tell us a bit about the past. By examining a map and its legend in detail, um, a map can reveal all sorts of information about the area it represents. And looking at old maps can give us a snapshot of history um, and what was going on at the time. So if we just have a quick look at an extract from the map legend in the top left, um, this one was um, one of the kind of first maps um, published in around 1920 to include um, surface type of roads. So it showed the growing importance of the motor car. Instead of just needing to know that there was a track linking two places, users wanted to know whether the road was metalled and in good condition for fast traffic um, or perhaps it was badly surfaced. Um, much like these kind of categories of roads changing, the OS legends, um, as you can see here in the top right, have changed. Um, this one shows glassworks, ironworks and smithies. Um, and this shows the kind of industrial nature of Great Britain in the late 1800s. So things like that don't really exist on our maps um, today um, and are not really of huge significance. We may now see wind turbines and um, solar panels. So kind of this change in what we show on our maps tells us a little bit about what was happening at the time that it was published. Modern maps also include features that give a kind of indication of a history of a place. So for example, Gothic writing um, such as tumuli or earthworks on kind of the image on the bottom left, they indicate an archaeological site. It's likely to be prehistoric or medieval but not Roman um, and will often be kind of things like burial mounds or remains of old hill forts. Um, they all again give a kind of indication of the history of an area. Um, stretches of road or earthworks um, confirmed to be originally Roman are also marked on OS maps um, and they're labelled in kind of capital um, letters um, in serif fonts um, as an example on the bottom right. Um, so that's everything we've got um, to say today really. Um, am I, I think I'm handing back to Jess. Are you just going to do the wrap up and then we'll move on to some questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Hannah. Um, and yeah, hopefully you all found that interesting and learned something new about Ordnance Survey and have got a new appreciation for the mapping and what goes into them as well. If you are interested in learning out a little bit more or want to do a bit of a deeper dive into some of the stuff we've talked about today, we've got a new platform um, called More Than Maps where we've got loads of information and examples about different elements of cartography and also different elements of data visualization. So if you scan the QR code on the screen, I'll leave it up for a little bit longer. So you've got a chance to do that. That will take you over there or alternatively just use the URL as well. Um, there's loads of other stuff on More Than Maps too. So if you work in the industry or want to have a bit of a deep dive on some of the data that we use or Ordnance Survey as well, there's tons and tons of information on that there too.